On behalf of the entire CLA congregation and our ministry team, welcome. Come with your broken hearts. Come with your hope for healing. Ven con tu ira y tus sueños de mañana mejor. Come, come knowing that whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your belief, wherever you are from, come, come you, you are, are welcome, welcome here. here. Eres bienvenido aquí. Together, we join as a community of many faiths and of people with conscience with grief in our hearts and a dream for a better tomorrow. We invite you to be present to your grief and your sadness, your pain and loss through ritual throughout this rally. When you wish to release tears you have been holding, come forward and place a pinch of salt into the bowl of the inner water. Cuando desees liberar las lágrimas, ven al pongo un poco de sal en este plato de agua comunitaria y cuando se sienta esperanzado, tome un poco de azúcar en este plato de agua comunitaria. And when you are feeling hopeful, take a pinch of the sugar and add it to the beautiful one. En este espíritu podamos construir comunidad y avanzar hacia la restauración y la esperanza. Welcome. Welcome everyone to this rally for love over hate. It is so good to see you all here this afternoon. We not only have a capacity crowd here, but we have friends who are seated in the chapel, which is back and those of you who are standing you may want to consider going into the chapel so you are able to be seated and be comfortable and the job is
and no to violent speech and no to white supremacy and no to all of the things that try to tear us apart. When we look when we looked at the events in Charlottesville, Virginia, it was truly a wake-up call for all of us who had been apathetic. And all that said to me when the election happened, well, we need to give him a chance. Well, sisters and brothers, uh, you know, he has now all the chances that he needs. We know what it feels like. We know what it feels like. We know what it is that we must resist. And what we resist is the negativism and we embrace that which is positive. We resist the hate, and we embrace the love. We exist the exclusive, narrow vision of xenophobia, and we declare inclusivity in all of its broadness, and all of its radical forms, that all of us, we are a part of this country, and whether you like it or not, we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. We're Church, Reverend Earl Ross, the Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church, the Reverend Dr. Kendrick Carey, 
Plymouth Church, where I'm from, uh, Reverend Timothy Tuck, uh, uh, and also the River Road Unitarian Universalist Congregation, the Spirit of Love and Deliverance Baptist Church with the Reverend Dr. Raymond C. Bell as the pastor, the Ambassador uh, Ch uh, Baptist Church where Reverend Wanda Thompson is pastor, SEIU 32BJ, the, the Baptist Convention of Washington, D.C., and for Senators, the Reverend A.C. Durack, President, the Baptist Ministers Conference of Washington, D.C., and for Senators, Charlie Smith, President, the Progressive National Baptist Convention, Eastern Region, Reverend Keith Byrd, President, the Village, where Reverend Dr. Lewis Tate, Jr. is the pastor, and the Unitarian Universalist Church of, West, of Reston, Virginia, the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 1994, Gabriel Acevedo, uh, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Rockville, the Washington Ethical Society, Twin Brook Baptist Church, uh, Trans Women of Color Collective, Lincoln Congregational Temple, and Moco Pride Center are among these who have been brought. to say we need to stand together today and from this moment on and not be divided in the pettiness that people try to sell to us. Because many of us, we, we go down very often without thinking about what we're buying into. But I'm saying today, don't buy into the petty agendas. Buy into the large, grand agenda of love and uplift of one another and support to each other.
made sacred by our presence and the presence of the holy in which we live, move, and have our being. Let us be together now. Let us feel the sense of connection and togetherness. And as we are together, let us remember ever higher who gave her life standing up and marching for justice, for love, and for a more inclusive community. Let us remember the two Virginia State troopers who lost their lives trying to provide safety and security for those who have gathered. Let us remember the 19 who were injured and received medical attention. Let us remember those, the many who were injured. Let us remember their families, their loved ones, and their friends. Let us remember all those who showed up, clergy, activists, those committed for social justice, people of goodwill and moral conscience who showed up in Charlottesville. Let us remember the thousands who showed up yesterday in Boston. Let us remember all those who are here and who are with us in spirit. And in that spirit of togetherness, I now invite some of my colleagues to come forward to offer some prayers, prayers of healing and remembrance. I'd like to welcome Reverend Patty Fears from Fellowship Baptist Church, Reverend Walter Thompson, the Ambassador of Baptist Church, Imam Siddiqui Ali from the Muslim Institute for Interfaith Studies and Understanding, Reverend Nancy McDonald Ladd from River Road Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Rabbi David Schneer from Akhrolev, Ila Hadasha, and Jews United for Justice. We'll offer brief prayers. <laughs>
but we all must set aside. Whatever malice, hatred, or negative thing resides in us to embrace one another and truly be inclusive. In God's name I pray, amen. amen. We gather united in prayer to that God which is greater than every name we ever made up for God. To that God which unites us, that God which connects us, that transcends all of our particularity and the universality of hope. Hope you join me in prayer. Dear God, you who are greater than us and braver than us, we gather in this place guided and goaded by your fierce love so that we may find the fierce love that comes within us. Dear God, we know these are unsafe times. As in fact, the whole span of our nation's history has been an unsafe era, an unsafe time, an unsafe place for people of color here among us, our brothers and sisters, our siblings in faith. We ask that we might fear that country we have created, where our brothers and sisters might live without safety, without surety, without the comfort of knowing that this place has always been welcome. Each and every one. May we be guided, may we be goaded, may we be fierce. And may those of us who somehow found ourselves surprised by the circumstances of hate to living in this country go forward from here, awake anew and willing always to begin again the work of building love with every tear and every labor of our hands. Amen. Hate begets hate, violence begets violence. It is a vicious circle. There has to be another way. We are all creation of God, some say children of God. We call upon the creator of all human beings and of all living things. God Almighty for help. We are brothers and sisters to each other. Let's look at each other, protect each other. Time is now. Prophet Muhammad said, help the brother and sister when they do something good and when they do something wrong and evil. One of his companions spoke up. We understood to help someone when they do good. How can we help someone if that person does bad, spreading hate or hurting someone? Prophet said, and hold their hands. God said, the death of one person is the death of all human beings, and saving one life as is saving all human beings. Today we are called to save humanity by holding the hands of those who are hurting or threatening blacks, Jews, Muslims, immigrants, and LGBTQ. Stop them from hurting our communities and killing our people. God spoken in Quran asking believers to join together in unity and do not divide. Stand a solid wall against bigotry, xenophobia, anti-black, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia and homophobia. When they hurt one of us, they hurt all of us. Love you. In the Hebrew sacred tradition, there are two prayers that are prayed to God who is known by many names, seeking God's guidance to lead us from untruth to truth, from ignorance to wisdom, from mortality to immortality, seeking God's guidance that all be well, all be peaceful, 
only fit for excellence, and that no one suffer. Om Asatoma Satyamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Rutyorma
forgive us for putting our earth What um, all people's witness in Charlottesville and what the Jewish community in particular, particular witness um, and the members of the synagogue uh, where marchers, um, you know, pass by, um, it felt uh, like a return to the past that uh, was so uh, two members of, of uh, our community. And this is a song that was uh, sung by many Jews in the concentration camps. It's a song, it's a prayer. Anima, anim, I believe. Anima, anima, anim, in the Munash Neyma, with a complete faith in the coming of the Mashiach, in the coming of the Messiah, in the coming of the Messianic age, in the coming of a world uh, of, of peace and of justice for all. Martin, who is the associate pastor of Rock Springs, and 
David Miller from the New York Church in Fairfax, and, uh, Reverend Marvin Silva, if he is here, I don't know, and Katie Day. These are words that I wrote after being in the UVA hospital last Saturday. You, all five of you, walked into the ER with blood on your clothes, hit by sticks, beaten by shields, thrust into you. Police say that you can't have your backpacks inside. Why didn't they tell me that? as I sat with mine in the waiting room. You were still bleeding beyond the bandages. I take your bags to my car. You go back and are stitched, stitched, stitched. Hours pass. Hospital on lockdown, security check, security check. Three of you are released. You want to return to the rally with hospital bracelets and bruises and cuts. Wait, wait. People have been hit by a car. 20 stretchers lined up outside. Clean white sheets, pristine for now. Get back, get back. Security check, security check. There's not enough room in the ER to triage. So the lobby of the hospital is made into triage. Siren one, siren two, siren blue. The other two of you are released. I had to get plastic surgery, you tell me. Your treatment took five hours. I'm worried about my transgender friend. She's elderly and was left alone at the church. Let's go look for her. Driving through the streets, Nazi flag smoke. She is at the church. Safe? Are we? When I get home, I find that I too have bruises. Siren one, siren two, code blue. I did 20 minutes on this this morning. Would you like me to do that or no? <laughs> Um, I went to Charlottesville. I've been to many protests before. I was in Phoenix in 100 degree heat while police officers were arresting my colleagues and friends. I have been uh, standing between occupiers and police officers while the occupiers were spitting on the police officers and I was afraid that was going to turn into a mess. But I have to say I never experienced anything like last Saturday. When I went last Saturday, I wasn't shocked. When I got there, there were very few people at the park, and they were standing with camouflage, uh, pants, semi-automatic weapons, knives, sidearms, hatchets, and they were lining the street. This was before the other clergy got there. And they were supposed to provide the safety. The police officers were off to the side. They were behind a barrier where they never moved from once until they cleared the park. The white supremacists were up in the park. I don't know if you've ever been to Charlottesville. It's a small park. So when you shove a lot of white supremacists up into a park, tempers, I'm going to guess, are pretty bound to flare. And then there were other folks. There were people on the left who I will have to say are tired of peaceful protests. And they came ready for whatever was going to happen. And then there were clergy. 
and protesters from the traditional liberal left who were trying to keep it peaceful and who got scattered when the fighting began. The title of my sermon this morning was History Meets at the Corner because it all happened at one corner in front of the park. As they started to take the bottles that we had been passing out to everyone, regardless of ideology, bottles of water and throwing them at each other. Then came the pepper spray, and then came the sticks, and then came the rocks and the shields. And as things started to break up, I went to a first aid tent to help there, and people were trying to clear pepper spray out of the eyes of those who had been affected. And we kept saying, the clergy kept inviting whoever was coming with pepper spray, whether they were white supremacists or not because we wanted to try and help people and show the love that we had. I will tell you this, I don't want to run over time, but I'll tell you this. The experience of humans and humanity to humans that I experienced on that day was the only thing that shocked me. It was equal opportunity hate. I was raised Jewish, and I have to tell you, The amount of anti-Semitism shocked me. It is time for us to walk into the wilderness together. All of us. It will take a risk of our comfort. It will take a risk of our privilege. We may feel fragile. It is time for us to show up. Thank you. from our organization drive down to Charlottesville and we when we arrived our forces um, on the ground were scattered there's a lack of communication between groups and there's there was no clear plan of action for the day um, the organizations of the far right on the, on the other hand were very organized and they had used violence and intimidation the night before on their torch lit march and were confident openly espousing their genocidal politics Uh, Those of us uh, on Saturday who were able to rally our forces at the park um, marched towards downtown because we had heard that the fascists were attempting to march on a a low-income housing project. So we wanted to stand in solidarity solidarity with these people and uh, march against the far right. And it was this march that was uh, later attacked. Um, When the car hit, everyone was in shock, um, but everyone immediately went into action to help those who were injured in whatever way that they could. Um, People helped pull each other out of the street, um, trying to stop people from bleeding, uh, calling for medics, calling for ambulances. And the reality is is that the far right saw this rally in Charlottesville as a huge, huge success for their side. Um, The Southern Poverty Law Center has said it was the largest gathering of the far right in decades. And these are the people who gloated about the death of Heather Hare. Um, And excuse my language, but this is a a summary of what they said. They called her a a fat 32-year-old child a slut. These are people who hate women. They hate gays, blacks, whites, Jews. And this is... The point is that we have a common enemy. Um, now, the majority of the people uh, on Saturday, the counter demonstrators, counter demonstrators were were white radicals, socialists, anarchists. But you don't have to be a radical to be in this fight. Um, we recognize our differences, but like I said, we have a common enemy, and we're going to need the kind of organization and numbers that we saw yesterday in Boston, where. We outnumbered the far right a thousand to one. We need to use these forces to organize ourselves and show up wherever these people show their faces. And this, I think, 
can be used as a foundation not just to fight the far right and drive their hatred back to the margins, but to build a more equitable and just society for the future. Let us stand together because it seems like we all woke up this morning with our mind on freedom. Why don't we stand and let us make that declaration today. Lucy Murphy and also all of the DC Labor Chorus. And, and, and one of my musicians, Brother Maceo Kemp, who snuck in and got on the piano. Amen. And we're going to hear from some voices of faith. I want to invite forth uh, Reverend uh, George Gilbert, Jr. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Alina Suskin, uh, Rabbi Joseph Bierman, Bishop Allison Abrams, and Reverend Rosetta Robinson. Greetings. I greet you with the peace of God. Stand representing. The Baptist Ministers Conference of Washington, D.C. and vicinity. We want to thank Pastor Hagler and those who have gotten us all together and want to thank you for being here. The system wants us to give reverence for a flag and a song. The system wants us to ignore the symbols and statues of dominance of white supremacy and dominance against 
blacks in America. The system wants us to be controlled and scared by mean, corrupt police overseers. The system wants us to ignore white privilege. However, we refuse to bow down and accept the system's expectations. We will continue to bang the wall of racial hatred with the sledgehammer of righteous indignation. We will respond to hate with goodness. We will respond to fools with intelligence. Yes. <laughs> we will continue to move forward until the walls of America's hateful system that this country was built on will one day fall. They enslaved us, but we're still here. They whipped us, they beat us, almost to death, but we're still here. They lynched us, but we're still here. They pumped drugs into our communities, but we're still here. They brutalized us, threw us in jail, but we're still here. And we will continue to push America to to right its wrongs of slavery and hatred for the black kings and queens of our civilization. With God on our side, we will be strong. We will be vigilant and be righteous. With the recent actions of white supremacists and the condoning words of Donald Trump, white America, it is time that you, as you have done today, to choose love over hate. It is time. You can no longer stand on the sidelines and just say that you don't agree with racism while enjoying your white privilege. It is no longer acceptable for you to simply say that I am not racist because I have a few black friends. It is time that you stand in solidarity against the hate-filled white supremacists and the words and actions of Donald Trump. This is not a party issue. This is a God issue. Finally, I declare that in order for America to become beautiful, she must repent from her transgressions and repair the damages she calls toward the black family. Unless she repents and repairs, she will only reap the horrible seeds of evil that she has sown. Amen. God would not be God if he didn't punish America for its continued treatment of the black community. But we all have the power to fix this wrong and to do what God can't do without us. For we are his hands. We are his feet. So right now, it looks dark and dim. But I still have hope that he's still in, in control. He's a God that looks high, sits high and looks slow. He's a God that still has America in his eyes. Good afternoon, my friends. I'm gonna be just a little bit unseasonal for a moment. The Jewish holiday of Purim is celebrated in the late winter, early spring, around February or March. It is superficially a festive holiday, marking the salvation of the Jewish people from the evil advisor to a foolish ruler. Yes, really. 
The advisor takes umbrage at the fact that a Jew refuses to bow down to him, and so he marks the entire population in that kingdom for slaughter. This fate is averted by the actions of a woman, the niece of the man who refused to bow, who earlier in the story had just happened to become the consort of the king. She takes her life in her hands and goes to see the king to ask that the decree of slaughter be averted. It's a very abbreviated version of the story in the Book of Esther. But what is remarkable about this religious book is that nowhere is God explicitly mentioned in the book. Nevertheless, the tradition teaches that God is indeed present in the story, but hidden. Our sages say, from where do the Hebrew scriptures bring the name Esther? From the verse in Deuteronomy 31, 18, but I, God, will surely conceal my face. Haster astir pane. The name Esther is interpreted as the phrase for a concealed God. In the Purim story, it is left to humans to act. In the story of Esther, God is not missing, merely hidden. God is never directly mentioned in the story, but God acts unseen through us. In the fourth chapter of the book of Esther, Mordechai, Esther's unbowing uncle, comes to her and tells her that she must use the power and privilege that she has to save her people, and adds, and who knows if it were not for just such a time as this that you were raised to power. Just as in that story, God moves the characters into place, but leaves them to act, so it is up to us to act. Those of us with privilege must use it. We must all stand together at this time and at all times. It is, I think, not merely serendipity that the portion in the Hebrew scriptures that the Jew Jewish community read last week begins with the command to see. See, I place before you the blessing and the curse, it says. Which will we choose? Although this is a moment in which many of us are afraid, it is also partly a blessing. The fear that some of us have always lived in because of racism have become recognized by many who do not really see it before. Anti-Semitism, which is often dismissed as unimportant because some Jews are white-skinned and benefit from that, has been revealed as a still powerful force. Racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-immigrant sentiment, Islamophobia, all of these have the same root, and when you see one, you will see the others. All the intersectional forces which strip power from some of us can be seen clearly if we have the will to see it. And whether we choose to see or not, that will determine which path we walk down. The Jewish tradition warns elsewhere, with the justice that a person with power does, he sustains the earth, but the fraudulent person destroys it. If one sets oneself aside in the corner of the house and says, well, what have the affairs of society to do with me? What's in it for me to take part in their dispute? Why should I listen to their voices? I'm fine. This person destroys the world. This is the meaning of the fraudulent person destroys the world. Tomorrow, there will be an eclipse. A number of us have mentioned that. Light will seem to be swallowed by darkness, but it isn't really. It's just that the view of the light is blocked for a few minutes. Just now in the world, we too look around us and the world appears to be darkness. Like an eclipse, the light seems to be blotted out. But that glorious light continues, whether we see it or not. We see it. But in this world, to make sure that the light is revealed, to uncover the concealed face of God, it is upon us to act. First, for those who are threatened to help keep them safe. Second, 
to our lawmakers and leaders and anyone who by words or by silence, by acts or by inaction, lets racism and white supremacism flourish. They must know not only that we oppose them, but that we will act to oppose them and to vote them out. And third, to the people who believe such evil, and especially those who act on it and teach it to others, we have to find ways to reach them and educate them and end the cycles of ignorance, poverty, and violence in our nation. Amen. Amen. Esther had to choose. Do I risk my life and go before the king to save my people? Or shall I pretend nothing is wrong and live my life of luxury, unruffled by the storm outside my door? We too must learn to see, and then we must choose. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said in 1972, Morally speaking, there is no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings. Indifference to evil is worse than evil itself. And I beg the indulgence of my colleagues here for just one minute. I'd like to teach you a song. Um, it's short, it's easy. It was composed by my colleague, Rabbi Menachem Predator. And there will be a few people here who know it. It's very simple. The first verse is four words repeated four times from the book of Psalms in Hebrew. Olam chesed yibane. Actually, it's three words. Olam chesed yibane repeated four times. It means God will build this world with love. Olam, Olam. Chesed, chesed Yibane. Yibane. The second verse is four lines, also pretty simple. I will build this world with love. And you must build this world with love. And if we build this world with love, then God will build this world with love. Y'all game? Okay, let's. I'll sing it once, and then you can sing it with me the second time. Yeah. 
afternoon. I'm Bishop Allison Abrams. Um, I must say I'm a lesbian bishop uh, and pastor of House of the Lord Jesus. Thank you. I was, however, raised Baptist, licensed ordained Baptist, consecrated bishop while pastoring a Baptist church. But I will say that the church has been a great challenge in my own life. And I want to say we have to begin to challenge one another. We want to challenge the lawmakers. We want to challenge the policy makers. We want to challenge the people who have authority. But I want us to challenge one another. One of the things we have to do is when our friends begin to make racist statements, when our friends begin to make statements that show that there's some misogyny there, when our friends make statements that show that they may be homophobic or they may have some heterosexual, heterosexual uh, tendencies, we have to stand up and speak against that and begin to turn that around. So I'm here to challenge you today to turn your friends and family and neighbors and co-workers and those people who make those types of statements around you to turn them around. Because love begins with each and every one of us. And then when we begin to uh, spread it into the community, then I believe it can go a long way. And let me also add that sometimes God is calling for us to rise up to the next level. The policymakers that are currently in place, those who are politicians, may need to go. If they are not working on behalf of the people, if they cannot stand up when it comes to uh, voting for what is right, then that may mean that some of us may be called to come and then lead the people. So there may be somebody sitting in this room. I want to just put it out there. There may be somebody sitting in this room that needs to run for office. Uh, I believe that people can be replaced. Anybody believe people can be replaced? Sometimes people think that these jobs are forever, but people can be replaced. And so when we go to the polls, we need to make sure we're voting. Some of the folks that are in today are there because we did not vote and because we did not get our friends to vote and we did not get our families to vote. And so in order for change to come, sometimes change got to start with us. Let us not continue to look to the next person and place the blame. Let us look in the mirror and see how could we have helped? How could we have made a difference? How can we make the change? The change begins with us, and I believe that we are stronger together. So when you grab your neighbor, when you grab the person in front of you, grab the person behind you, grab the person all the way to the back, then if we go together and if we stand together, then I believe that we are stronger together. Let us remember that today. We are stronger together. Good afternoon. After uh, seeing the swastikas in Charlottesville and hearing the chants of blood and soil and Jews will not replace us, I've had my ancestors on my mind this past week. You see, my grandparents were survivors who lived through the horrors of Auschwitz. And so that means that almost all of their family members were murdered by the Nazis. Sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, friends, all murdered. So I felt fear and sadness and anger this past week that I didn't know were inside of me. And this kind of anti-Semitism in the United States is not new. A little over three years ago, a white nationalist who was also present at the Greensboro Massacre in 1979, opened fire on two people, killed two people outside the Jewish community campus in Overland Park, Kansas. That's where I grew up, where I went to high school in that same campus, just a few hundred yards from the Holocaust Memorial that my grandparents built for their family. While anti-Semitism is and always has been alive and well in this country, those most impacted by white supremacy in the United States are the indigenous people of this country, right? American Indians, and black people and people of color, including black Jews and Jews of color, and who face daily, vi daily violence through deeply embedded structures of racism. We have a sacred obligation to fight this racism. And as we do, 
we must also learn about how anti-Semitism is the animating force of white nationalism. Eric Ward writes, at the theoretical core of white nationalism is the idea that some secret cabal, some mythological power, must be manipulating the social order behind the scenes. For white nationalists, a Jewish conspiracy, some call it a Zionist conspiracy, is the only thing that could explain the fall of Jim Crow, could explain the rise of feminism and success of the LGBT movement and the election of a black president. And on the flip side, those in power, and this is a pattern that started in Christian Europe, that came from Christian Europe, those in power, including Donald Trump, have used the idea of a Jewish conspiracy to distract those who are oppressed from the true perpetrators of violence. As Puerto Rican Jew Aurora Levins Morales wrote, its purpose is to protect Christian elites from the outrage of the oppressed by throwing Jews under the bus, by redirecting their rage towards Jews. I want to pray, May it be your will, Lord our God and God of our ancestors, our foremothers and forefathers. Please guide us to understand and confront anti-Semitism, because like any other form of racism, it is evil that must be opposed. Help us to understand and confront it so that we can defeat white supremacy in the streets of our cities and in the White House and in the structures of our country so that all of us can be free and safe and whole. And we say, Amen. spiritual, they were declaring, I believe in a God that one day will set us free. Well, there's still more work to be done. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, it's always right to do what is right. And it certainly is right for us to be here today from all walks of life to respond to this national atrocity that happened in Charlottesville. And you know, and I know, that it was just a symptom of a bleeding sore, a wound that has not healed, the wound of racial hatred that has not healed and has been present in this country since its inception. If you agree with me, say amen. amen. I stand here remembering a trip that I took with disciples, women, I'm a disciple of Christ, ordained minister, disciple of Christ, last fall to South Africa. And I remember when I was there hearing about the genesis of apartheid. And I was hearing about the Africanas who were inspired by the KKK. Y'all know that story? You know that history? And so they looked at what was going on in America, and they began to model some of that and bring that to that system that they would develop that would oppress their people. Shame on us, what a legacy. What a vision to have shared with the world. Shame on us. Won't you tell your neighbor, shame on us. Now how about shame on me for not doing enough in my lifetime to end racial hatred. Shame on me for not doing enough to end racial hatred. <laughs> we got to get personal. 
this is the right time to get personal, it's the right time to have important conversations about race. I'm gonna be obedient to the time, and as I move uh, to the close, I, I, I want to mention that as a disciple of Christ, we, we say that we are a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. So we are working with diverse communities to confront racism and white supremacy with prophetic resistance. The prophetic resistance of the word of God. I want to share with you some words from our new general minister, Reverend Terry Ford Owens, who has said in response to Charlottesville, we cannot be silent when the humanity of black persons is being assaulted and terrorized. That's terror that we're living under. The commandment of 1 John 4.20 is calling us to account. Those who say, I love God and hate the brothers or sisters are liars. Liars. But those who do not love a brother or sister who they have not seen, could not love God whom they, who they have seen rather, could not love God who they have not seen. The commandment we have from John is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And with such love, we are compelled to work for justice and walk in peace. And now one other word from a disciple colleague, Reverend Dr. William Barber, who's committed to repairing the breach, the trauma that is affecting our nation, not only about racial justice, but poor people. We need love for one another. This is the time. And we need to be honest about how we got here. Love is not afraid to speak truth to this nation. And love wants justice for all. So if you are evangelical, conservative, liberal, if you are Muslim, if you are Jewish, if you are Christian, if you are Unitarian and you say you know and love God, then you would stand for justice. Justice, gender justice, racial justice, and justice for all peoples. This is the word of God for the people of God that we teach and is taught in Galatians 3.28 that we are entitled. God has the desire that we all should support fundamental equality for all people. Amen. 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 And we will be blessed again with the labor course.
DC Labor Corps. And as we go on, I just want to point out that Imam Johari Abdul Malik was supposed to be here, uh, is not here with us, uh, but uh, uh, he lifts us up in his thoughts and his prayers. Uh, and, uh, and so we move forward at this point. Uh, also, uh, uh, Gustavo Torres from uh, Casa de Maryland was uh, due to be here with us as one of the endorsing body, but is not here with us today. But we need to continue to be in solidarity with all of the struggles that uh, Casa de Maryland is engaged in and involved in. Uh, Also, uh, uh, Dr. Zainab uh, Chudry is uh, from CARE. Is, is Dr. Chudry here? Uh, again, uh, could not be here, but uh, is uh, standing in support and solidarity. And also, uh, Sister Lords Ashley Hunter from the Trans Women of Color Collective uh, sent word that she was not going to be able to make it here after all, but she holds us up in her thoughts and prayers and in solidarity. I want to invite forth uh, David Zarin from, uh, and also followed by uh, uh, him will be Jim Stoll, who is the director of the Office of Human Rights in Montgomery County. Jim Stoll and Dave Zari. Uh, how's everybody doing? Beautiful to see you all. Uh, my name is Dave Zirin, and I write about sports for a living. Um, and I, I could actually do a quick talk about Colin Kaepernick, <laughs> about Michael Bennett, about the brave athletes who are standing up right now to white supremacy, but that's not what I'm going to do. <laughs> Afterwards, if people want to meet, talk some sports, I'll make myself available. Um, but actually, I want to start by paying tribute to someone who passed away this weekend who never bowed to white supremacy, and I'm talking about Dick Gregory. My favorite Dick Gregory story is the one where he talked about it being the early 1960s and him stopping at a truck stop in the Dixie South. And two rough looking white gentlemen came up to him and they were standing around his table trying to intimidate him. Then his order came to the table and it was a whole fried chicken. <laughs> and they looked at Dick Gregory and they said, whatever you do to that fried chicken, we are going to do to you. So Dick Gregory picked up the fried chicken and kissed it. <laughs> I also want to say before my, my extremely brief remarks, I also just want to say in the spirit of reconciliation and in the spirit of fighting oppression, I want to say as a proud Jew that I stand with the struggle of the Palestinian people in their efforts for justice and freedom. And how important it is, just as it's so important for people who are white to speak out against racism, just as it's so important for men to speak out against sexism, it's so important for my Jewish sisters and brothers to speak out for the humanity of the Palestinian people. Um, but, but after, I want to speak though about my first thoughts after Charlottesville, and my first thoughts were about Lieutenant Richard Collins III, who was killed by a Nazi on the University of Maryland campus just 15 minutes from my house last May. Put your hands up if you know the story of Richard Collins III. Now, Richard Collins was of course a recent Bowie State College graduate. Richard Collins was effectively lynched on the UMD campus, just like the black GIs were lynched when they returned from World War II. Richard Gollins was also killed just 30 minutes from the White House, but not one tweet, not one word, not one anything from either this president, who's supposed to be the commander in chief, or even the US Army, not one word. 
This president has time to tweet about the facelifts of news anchors, but not enough time to lend comfort to the family of Richard Collins III. Now, after Richard Collins was killed, I thought about how, what is my role in fighting back against this targeting of our black and brown sisters and brothers? What is my role as an ally in this struggle? But I think what Charlottesville has opened up our eyes to and what it must teach us is that we are all targets when Nazis are on the march. Now, I think the people in this room know the famous saying from the Holocaust by Pastor Martin Niemöller about first they came for the socialists, but I didn't say anything because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the Jews, but I didn't say anything because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one else to say anything. I think we need to update this. And I update this with great humility and I speak in the first person on purpose because I remember when first they killed the Muslims in the mosque in Quebec and I did not rally when that took place. Then they killed Sir Venus Kochabatla, a 52-year-old Indian man shot in cold blood by a Trump supporter screaming, get out of my country in Kansas. And I did not say anything when that happened. Then they came for Richard Collins, and I did rally. We did try to organize, but very few numbers came out. And then they came for Heather Heyer, and we hit the streets. And Heather Heyer's family is a remarkable family, and one of the things that her cousin said yesterday, he said, I'm going to say what I know Heather would have said, which is why did it take the death of a white woman to finally wake us up? We don't know who's going to be next. We can't answer that. But we can say with utter confidence that the answer does not lie staying at home eating sheet cake. It was a satire. Okay, okay we could have the Tina Fey debate afterwards if we like. Um, <laughs> now, I don't think it was a satire. Now, I think, though, that the answer, it lies in what we saw in Boston yesterday. As Katie said, I mean, the idea of us outnumbering them 1,000 to 1, masses of us telling them that they do not belong in our cities. It lies this September 30th in the March for Racial Justice. Maurice Cook, one of the organizers, is here. I hope he puts his hand up. Maurice, please try to find Maurice Cook so we can speak about the March for Racial Justice on September 30th. It, it, the answer lies and us hitting the streets. And I close with the prophetic words of Nina Turner, one of the most powerful black women speaking political truth in this country right now. I was at a rally that Nina Turner spoke at at the Martin Luther King Memorial, and this is what she said. She said, we may have come to this country on different ships, but we are in the same boat. I am, I am proud to share a boat with all of you. Never again, never forget. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. No one is born hating another person because of the color of their skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes naturally to the human heart than the opposite. Nelson Mandela. 
Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jim Stowe, and I am pleased and I am privileged to serve as your director of the Office of Human Rights in Montgomery County. And I say I am pleased to serve, for I work for you. I'm here on behalf of the Office of Human Rights, the members of the Human Rights Commission, and the members of the Committee on Hate Violence, whose collective missions it is to advocate and to enforce the civil rights laws of Montgomery County and promote fairness and justice, and the assurance of a safe and violence-free community. On their behalf, we thank all of you for being here. We thank all of you for standing, and particularly the leadership here and this great congregation. Folks, see the lane. Cedar Lane, if you're in the house, just stand up, Cedar Lane. Stand up, Cedar Lane. Stand up, Cedar Lane. <laughs> to my good friend, Jenna Monty, thank you so much, sir. Cedar Lane, you are, and there are others in this great community of ours. But you are always on the cutting edge, pushing the envelope. And we thank you for your leadership. Because as of today, someone just showed me here in the audience today, a number of the so-called religious leaders in this country of ours, the conservative membership of this great religious part of our country, just today affirmed, because they've been quiet, they've been extremely quiet, but just today, affirming the support of the statements not made by the President of the United States. And I kept waiting, my friends, for the religious leadership of this great nation to speak out. Didn't hear from a single person. And I thought to myself, my goodness gracious, when did we become, those of us who are from the family of the community of belief and of faith, when did we become so silent on everything? on every important issue that faces all of us. What happened? What happened? Did you not remember the days of the 60s, 60s when we were the ones on the cutting edge, on the forefront, in the trenches as it were, providing the services, providing the background, providing the, the pound cake and the iced tea for the walkers and the marchers every single day. What happened to us? I remember very well my uncle calling about two o'clock in the morning. My uncle was six foot four, about 230 pounds, very strong, scrappy man, and always saw me as somebody who would never be afraid of anything. So his voice, when I heard it on the phone at two o'clock in the morning, really, really concerned me as a 11 year old young man in Belmont, North Carolina. Because for the first time, I heard my Uncle Greer speak with fear. He said, Jim, look out the window. And so as it turned out, my back door window faced his front yard. And there I saw blazing in his front yard this cross. And I still remember the flames. Although I was a hundred yards away, it was as though it was right in front of my face because what it said to me, for you see everything I'd heard at that point in time, I'd heard by way of magazine and newspaper and television. But now it was real. And so I heard his voice continue to say, you all keep your heads down. He went on as his voice trembled. 
Don't go near any windows. Everything's going to be all right. And so when I saw the fires that the tiki torches were making, as it seemed to be an endless line of folks who looked like you and me, paraded around the campus of the University of Virginia, I thought about those flames. Nineteen sixty-eight it was. This is 2017. What happened? Is it complacency? Is it some sense that things are better than they were and we ought to be grateful? Is it that we have made progress and we have made some progress and Maybe that's just enough for us. Let those who are coming behind pick up the torch, as it were, and let them carry on. Because you see, my legs are just a little bit too weary. My friends, we joined the county executive last week. I won't tarry and his condemnation of the heinous acts of these supremacist groups in Charlottesville. They exist, my friends, on this continued and evolving experiment, experimental landscape, I should say, whose boundaries are etched by the blood and the grit of those who fought and died for freedom. A promise of equal justice and equal rights and equal voice to bear witness to their truth. That was what was on display in Charlottesville. Whether we agree or disagree, their voice is guaranteed. Because you see, it's part of that freedom that we talk about, that all of us are due. And though we get accused oftentimes in these gatherings of always preaching to the choir, well, my friends, sometimes the choir is just not singing loud enough. <laughs> sometimes we have not done our due diligence. And so I will close by this. Organize some meetings, organize some programs, some events, some activities in your home, your place of business, and your place of worship. Have as your focus an opportunity to learn about somebody who's different than you, about where they've come from, about their culture, about their faiths. Because you see, when we do this, those voices that are guaranteed to be able to speak because that is our freedom, that is our right. You see, their voices become, their extremist voices become nothing but shrill, tough, throated messages that become drowned out by our symphony of diverse voices, our diverse voices of peace and reason, which makes our community such a wonderful place to live. And so I'll end with this. My friends, on September 17th at Wheaton Regional Park, we will host our fifth annual friendship picnic, a chance for you and me to be in a place and a space with all the folks of goodwill in this county to celebrate who we are for no other reason but that. To go on notice that in Montgomery County, we respect each other, we lift up each other, we encourage each other, and we hold each other accountable when we do not. Yes. Dr. King said it this way. Fiscal force can repress, restrain, coerce, destroy. But it cannot create or organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. The ultimate end of violence is to defeat the opponent. The ultimate end of nonviolence is to win the friendship of the opponent. And so the aftermath of violence is bitterness. 
and the aftermath of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. And the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of a beloved community. Yes, love. Love, which means understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemies. Thank you. Jim Stowe opened up the door, and I'm going to call on Roger Berliner uh, to come and I think the stand statement will be read. Any elected officials want to come and say a word? Come on. Hmm? I'm not Roger Berliner. No. I'm right. Yeah, that's right. Come on. come on anyway. But I know there's a statement. <laughs> there was a statement from uh, J uh, Roger Berliner, and, and yes, yes, I do know you. Thank you. Great. Thank brother. you. Um, let me let me just say it. My name is George Leventhal. I won't try to. I, I won't try to repeat the many great words that have been said. It's just such a blessing to live here in this community, to look out at this audience, to know that no matter where we were born, no matter what language we speak at home, no matter where we worship on which day of the week, no matter who we love. All of us in this congregation and all of us in this community have one thing in common. We chose this place to be our home. We could have lived anywhere. Most of us have studied elsewhere. Most of us have worked elsewhere. We could have lived in other countries. We could have lived in other communities. But we chose this place to be our home, Montgomery County, Maryland. Because even though we have leadership in the White House that does not reflect our values and the things in which we believe, here in this community, we can be courteous to each other. Here in this community, we can be civil to one another. We can accept one another. We can live together and succeed together. And so I'm just glad to be here. I'm glad to have the chance to give these greetings. There have been a lot of words said today, and now we'll hear a few more from my colleague who couldn't be here but who sent his chief of staff, uh, Council President Roger Berliner's chief of staff, Cindy Gibson, has a message from uh, Roger Berliner, president of the Montgomery County Council. Again, I'm George Leventhal. Thank you. Hi, I am here representing Council President Roger Berliner for the Montgomery County Council today. And he wanted me to share with you a statement that the council put out last week. Um, and he wanted me to read it on his behalf and on behalf of the entire council. Montgomery County has a long history of cultivating a, welcome, a welcoming community filled with acceptance and tolerance for all residents. We stand together to reject bigotry, misogyny, homophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and xenophobia. We also stand with the people of Charlottesville, Virginia, who reject hate in all forms, and who were sickened by the August 12th rally of white nationalists who converged on their community. Our residents, like others throughout the country, look to our president in these challenging times to speak to and remind all Americans of our highest ideals and our most fundamental values not to debase them. It was unconscionable for P President's first words regarding Charlottesville to emphasize that many sides were responsible for what took place there, as though there was a moral equivalency between those there solely to advance hate and division and those there to stand on behalf of our common humanity. When the President then subsequently doubled down on that sentiment by blaming both sides, the president lost all moral authority. It is unconscionable to equate white supremacists, Ku Klux Klan members, neo-Nazis, and other alt-right white nationalist groups with those who participated in counter-protests. In so doing, 
the president has justifiably earned condemnation from most Americans and has only won the praise of the white extremists that he emboldened. He owes the American people an apology. The council went on to say that our thoughts and prayers go out to the family and friends of Heather Heyer, those injured during the counter protest, and Lieutenant H.J. Cullen and Trooper Pilot Burke M.M. Bates, who lost their lives serving the people of Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of a nationwide movement to resist hate, to defend our democracy and fight white supremacy in the White House. Today's gathering makes it very clear that when we organize and join hands with the massive, massive resistance movement in this country in partnership with frontline communities targeted by this administration and the white supremacists, we can prevail and win. So what do we do going forward? Well, we need to tell Congress once again and this time more loudly than ever to refuse to side with white supremacists. Democrats and Republicans in Congress alike must take a public stand from hate taking a front seat in the White House, with the President showing his alignment with white nationalists after Charlottesville we must get our members of Congress on record. Because will they... We need to ask them, will they continue to enable this president's immoral agenda or turn toward protecting democracy and our lives? And to those who have condemned the violence but have refused to specifically denounce the president and even recently confirmed that they stand with the president and his both sides argument, we say to them, your position is extremely hurtful to all those who have felt the brutal effects of Nazis, the Ku Klux Klan and white supremacy and betrays the value of dignity dignity, justice, and equality that we hold dear. Because there can only be one moral position when it comes to condemning racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, white supremacy, and anti-immigrant hatred. Publicly condemn and affix blame solely on those white supremacy ideologues for inciting hate and violence. Unequivocally declare that white supremacy is repulsive, counter to all this country stands for and has no place in this country. Right. Now, one white supremacist is out of the White House. But there are several more to go. We have work to do, people. We also need to demand corporate funders cut off white supremacist hate groups. Credit card providers like Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover are making big money from processing the funds for white supremacist groups like Stormfront, giving them the funds to plan events like the Unite the Right rally. If companies refuse these services, we can stop hate groups from being able to fund rallies like this in the first place. We need to let them know that communities will not stand for corporations that aim to profit from white supremacy and ask them to take immediate action and cut hate groups off from their financial service platforms.
We need to continue to call for the removal of all Confederate symbols from places of honor in America. Because symbols of the Confederacy are symbols of America's history of racist hate. And they embolden white supremacists to march on the streets without shame. And they must all come down now. And this is for my interfaith colleagues and people who are belonging to communities of faith across the theological spectrum. We could be and should be doing more challenging white supremacy in our own communities, in this nation, and across the globe. Why? Because at the heart of our endeavors, interfaith movements tend to affirm particular identities without claiming that any one of these identities is superior to or supreme over all the others. We say no one has a copyright on truth. We commit ourselves to better understanding each other and actually working cooperatively with one another despite our differences. And tonight is an example of how we can still occupy common ground even if we do not share in values or ideas or beliefs. We can still do that. Because when we find that this harmony is possible amidst our diversity, when we recognize that our differences need not divide us, we as interfaith movements can also move toward collective action on behalf of the common good. So what I have in mind is something larger, more massive, more ready to act wherever and whenever the supremacists strike. And to get to that state of readiness, however, will require that all of us get well prepared to be interventionists into situations in which the supremacists are ready to provoke hatred and violence, disruption and disarray, injury, and yes, even death. And these interfaith movements can bring their collective voices and actions to the places where the supremacists are endangering both religious and civic values, disrupting neighborhoods and communities, and threatening human life. We've got work to do. Who we who identify ourselves as people of faith or faithful people or people of conscience guided by our commitments to our faiths and moral values and our solidarity. Dr. King said, we are now faced with the fact that today, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. There is no time for apathy and complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. Amen. So let us say yes to vigorous and positive action. And as we prepare to adjourn nearly on time, nearly on time, not quite there, but nearly on time, I want to, I want to do something as, as you have made that call, because it is about eventually moving forth into our action to challenge paradigms of white supremacy and hatred, to allow it never, ever to be comfortable. And one of the things that I want to lift up is that we have fallen so easily into the language of right and left, or conservative and liberal. And we've thought nothing about using that language over and over again. What I really know is not that something is liberal or conservative, but I know whether it's right or wrong. And, 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 and being right is not to the left or it's not to the right, if I can use that. But it's understanding what is fair and decent. Yeah. Right now, people have made a sport out of 
abhorring being, as they put it, politically correct. And as I argued with somebody who was trying to argue that they were tired of being politically correct, I finally had to ask him the question. I don't know what your mother taught you, but I know that my mother taught me to be respectful of somebody else. Yes. That's being politically correct. That's right. Is to be respectful of somebody else. Not to call you out of your name, not to demean you, not to dehumanize you, but to treat you as a unique and creative invention of creation. To treat you with love, dignity, and respect. What's going on right now all down at Capitol Hill is folks have hidden white supremacist ideology in this language of being right or left, conservative or liberal. To take away or attempt to take away folks' health care is not right or left, it's just evil. Yes. To treat immigrants as if they don't count as if they have no humanity, as if they bring nothing of value into the society, is not right or left, it's just evil and xenophobic. And what I'm getting at here is not right and left politics that we're talking about in this country right now. We're talking about xenophobia, exclusivism, we're talking about hatred, we're talking about folks treating other people as other and without any dignity, and that's what we got to stand up against is challenge every single politician that utters anything out of their mouth, whether they stand in a place that offer dignity and respect to all human beings, or whether they stand only offering dignity and respect to some human being. We need to challenge them on that. I'm thankful and I'm blessed this evening because my father's here with me, who's 97 years of age, 96. And you see, I heard stories all my life from him that when he was drafted in World War II into the Navy and the person on the ship said there's nothing that a Negro can do on this ship but shine my shoes and bring me my meals. And then my father said, well, this Negro ain't on your ship then. He's been fighting against racism all of his life. That's where I get it from. Standing up, even in this season. And I'll tell you another story, and I preach this, and then I want to do something. I went back to Plymouth as folks were having all of this angst about same-gender marriage, Brother Bell. And I was over joking with my father because I know that they were super voters. And I said, you're going to vote, right? He said, of course I'm going to vote. I said, well, who are you going to vote for? He said, I'm going to vote for Obama. And I'm going to vote for same-gender marriage. Which surprised, shocked me. And I said, you are? And you know what his answer was? His answer was, he says, I've been discriminated against all my life. And I'll be damned if I'm going to vote to discriminate against somebody else. That's preachable. That's preachable, preachers. Right? 
The fact is, is that we bring our soul into what we do. You know, it says, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. If, if you don't want to be treated unjustly, then treat folks with justice. Treat folks with dignity. Treat folks with hope. Now, one of the things is that as we build, we're going to build because we're going to challenge some folks on it, on the Capitol grounds. We're going to challenge some folks down at the U.S. Capitol. As, as Reverend Barber, who I'm working with, is building a, a movement around moral agenda around a poor people's campaign, we're, we're going to continue to build it. I want any clergy, any clergy from Virginia to come up here and stand. Any clergy from Virginia to come up here and stand right here today. Come and stand. And there were some clergy that were here. I saw them leave, and I know they're from Virginia. We got any clergy from Washington, D.C.? Any clergy from Washington, D.C. to come and stand? Look at that, look at that, look at that. And, and folks say that D.C. folks are afraid to come out of D.C. and the Maryland. Here they are. Any clergy from Maryland here? I, I know they are. Come on and stand. And you see, I want us to see that we stand across geographical boundaries. Yes. Folks always want to divide us up by saying, well, that's a Maryland issue, or that's a Virginia issue, or that's a D.C. issue. And they win every time because they know how to play this game of division, how to separate us off from one another. But we recognize today that our dignity and the dignity of the people that we serve is intricately linked to the dignity and the respect of somebody else. Doesn't matter whether you're Christian. Doesn't matter whether you're Jewish or, or Muslim or a humanist. It doesn't matter. We are united in principles of dignity and hope. It doesn't matter. Wherever we come from, but we recognize that there is a power when we stand together. Now, one of the things is that when we go out, you know, uh, I, I'm going to say this to clergy, this is part of my charge. <laughs> is clergy have a tendency to go out and put on their religious garb and go out there and stand up there and they read some litanies and they say some prayers and they go home and think that they've done something. <laughs> We're calling for a little bit more. That's right. Yeah. When you go out, don't go out alone. All right. You're in a pulpit, use that pulpit and use the community that you serve in order to organize a constituency to come out and stand with you so that when you're standing there as First Congregational, there are people from First Congregational. Or you're standing there from Cedar Lane, there are people from Cedar Lane. Or from Plymouth, or from Solad, there are people from that church because that's what's going to make the difference is we communicate what we know to rank and file. That we communicate our faith and our belief to the people we serve. That begins to change the realities. Now, as we are here this day, we've had passed around a sign-up sheet, and I hope all the clergy have signed up that sheet, and all of you as well. Because, see, it engages all of us. All of us, all of us. Without any exception. Because, see, I come from the school where there are some of us who are ordained and there's some of us who are licensed. But the reality is, is all of us are called. Yeah. 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 Help me with that. All of us are called to be engaged in bringing a difference into the places in which we live. To teach our neighbors. To teach our friends. You know how many people go out with their friends and their friends tell a little racist joke Come on now. or a homophobic Come joke on now. and because they're your friends you don't challenge them? 
Well, that's how hatred and division and racism continues to foster. Yes, yes. Is that we got to be able to say, no, 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 sister or brother, no. That, 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 that is not here. That, I don't want to hear that. We got to be those kinds of people. Right, to stand in solidarity with each other. I'm going to ask that the clergy up here, if you would link your hands together, if you will link your hands together. Stretch it across the aisles if necessary. Because we recognize that there is strength in the human chain. There's strength, there's strength. When we stand together. There's strength when we hold each other up. There's strength when we defend each other. You see, I don't need to wait until the attack comes to me. If the attack has come to you, it's already come to me. And I need to be engaged. And we need to be engaged. So we're making a pledge today, a sacred and holy vow today, that we're not going to let those forces of hatred overrun this nation or overrun our communities. We make a pledge this day that we stand up for justice. Yes. We make a pledge today that there's no, I'm a just-minded person, but leave the butt out. <laughs> Sit on the butt. <laughs> But there are no exceptions. I either love you in your full humanity or I don't love you at all. So sisters and brothers, we're called to be a people that embrace one another. That's how we stand against hatred. I can't allow anybody to touch Reverend Janamanchi. Why? Because... He is my brother. No, he's deeper than that. He's me. Or Bishop Abram. She's me. We belong to each other. And because we belong to each other, we defend one another. We protect each other. We offer dignity and respect and hope. You say... In history, Reverend Robinson, you raised South Africa. There was a call in Soweto that was a genesis of a movement. Or Wounded Knee, that's part of a continued reminder of a movement. Or Philadelphia, Mississippi. That reminds us of the genesis of a movement. Or Stonewall in New York. That reminds us of the genesis of a movement. Or Charleston, South Carolina. That reminds us of a genesis of a movement. Or Charlottesville, Virginia. That is the genesis of a movement that is going to really deal with the healing and the hurt and the pain and to eradicate the racism that exists in this country and say no more, no longer will this division happen on our watch. We will not go home and be quiet, but we are activated from this moment on. Preachers, teachers, leaders, are you ready? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. We're ready together. And so let us go forth. Lead us in something that we can uh, internalize our togetherness today as we prepare to adjourn from here.
As we prepare to adjourn from this gathering today, uh, I'm going to ask that Reverend Jenna Manchi will come and lift up a, a blessing. But also to recognize that even here in Bethesda, there are struggles that we need to deal with. One is River Road African Cemetery Project, the Macedonia Baptist Church. You need to see them if you don't know about it. And we have also been diligently working with nurses at the uh, Holy Cross Hospital. Yes. We have been dealing with a union busting uh, administration right now. And so we lift that up to you in prayer and in thought, and that's another place in which we can be engaged. But there are struggles that we need to engage in that we can bring justice not only to the community locally, but to the community nationwide. Reverend. Thank you, Reverend Hagler, and thank you. Thank you, my beloved colleagues, for rising and standing with us. I also would like to take a moment to thank all of our security volunteers and our ushers and our greeters. Who came, who answered the call from different congregations and also from the anti-fascist organization of DC, of the DC region and also others who just stepped up when we asked for some help. We are grateful for your presence, your hospitality, and your welcome today. Thank you. Thank you. We end our services here at Cedar Lane with a blessing that I wish to share with you. We say, go in peace, go making peace. Live gently, love fiercely, and bow to the mystery. So may it be. So may it be. Amen. 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 Amen.